Hi, everybody, and welcome to Chapter 4 of Pilgrim of the Sky. Um, as a reminder, I am podcasting or video casting or novel casting or however you want to call it, um, my novel Pilgrim of the Sky, which was published uh, by Candle Mark and Gleam. The book is uh, something you can find online, of course. Uh, you can follow my blog, which is natanyabaron.com, and there are appropriate links there, but you can also follow me on Twitter, which is over there. Um, I got that right this time. Practice makes perfect. Um, and if you've been following along, we've gotten to the point where um, Maddie has woken up inside of a body that is very much like hers, but is not quite hers, with a world where she's met someone who seems very familiar to her, like Randy, the young man she takes care of uh, in her the world that she was born into, except he's absolutely not. So I'm just going to jump right into the reading, and I'll try to hang around a little bit later um, if anyone is around and has some questions. So this is another relatively long chapter, so if you're following along, um, probably will take about 40 minutes or so, but we'll uh, have some floating mansions, as I promised. So This is Chapter 4, Misgivings. When Maddie next awoke, it was with the same headache, but to less fanfare. All signs of Matilda's presence were gone, and Mrs. Fitz was nowhere to be seen. The drapes on the windows were still drawn tight against the light, so much so that Maddie had no perception of time. How was it that Matilda flourished in such dark places? Part of her was disappointed that she was not at home, but she had to admit, as terrifying as her first encounter with Matilda was, she was glad to be in charge again, and here. She was unsure whether it was due to the mystery of Alvin's disappearance, the strange connection she felt to Randall, or simply lingering curiosity. But part of her would have been disappointed to wake up in her bedroom back home. Her body, Matilda's body, she reminded herself, ached everywhere. But when she explored under the covers, she found that she'd been changed into a different set of bedclothes, and from the scent of lavender and vanilla, bathed as well. She had no recollection of such an experience, however, and felt a little uncomfortable, moving down into the covers more. No, maybe home was a better idea. Taking a deep breath, Maddie reclined on the soft pillow and listened to the sounds of the old house. She noticed the murmur of distant voices every now and again, the chink of silverware and china, the creak of floorboards as people moved to and fro. She noticed, too, the smell of baking bread and roasting meat with sage. It was a house full of people and a house full of mysteries. Finally, after deciding that staying in bed would accomplish nothing but still lingering a little longer under the warm blankets, Maddie rose and went to the large dresser and vanity set and seated herself. There was just enough light from the gas lamp to illuminate the face in the mirror, and Maddie turned her cheek to get a better look at Matilda's face. She had a much more intense look. Her cheekbones were higher, and it made her almond-shaped brown eyes look larger, deeper. The hair was longer than hers, but the same color brown, unremarkable, but nothing that required much in the way of coloring. She had the same full bottom lip, the same rounded eyebrows, familiar and yet strange, off enough to be mesmerizing. When she'd had enough of the reflection, Maddie turned to examine the antique vanity itself. It was a marvelous piece of furniture with a Victorian elegance, but its beauty was dulled due to the magnificent objects upon it. A silver grooming set, an inlaid copper jewelry box, a hurricane lamp with brilliant stained glass roses, and more. She ran her fingers over the multitude of beautiful pieces. The priceless objects made her yearn for the library. She wanted to know their history, their make, and provenance. These pieces in particular held her intention, though. She could swear she could have seen them before. One was a silver pocket watch engraved with the initials M-A-R. Another was a pin with a Japanese beetle done entirely in minuscule mosaic, and the last was a copper mirror with turquoise inlay in the shape of a fleur-de-lis. Were they things her grandmother had owned? Or had she seen them in a museum? She couldn't recall. Maddie took a silver ring out of one of the drawers and slipped it on her finger, 
a perfect fit. She looked down at her hands and sighed. As much as she wanted, she could no longer trust her own body, and she could no longer believe this was simply a dream. There was too much mounting evidence to the contrary. Randall would likely visit her again, and she could hopefully get more answers. No, not hopefully. She would get more answers. She deserved them. Who did he think he was anyway? But the thought was discomforting. She knew that she trusted Randall on impulse because she trusted Randy. But what was to say Randall was any less devious and cruel than Matilda? A polite knock on the door brought her out of the dark and into the present. It's Randall, a voice announced. Uh, come in, she said, turning slightly. There was a shawl over the back of the chair, and she grabbed it, wrapping it around her shoulders. Modesty was likely not something with which Matilda was familiar, but for the moment, Maddie was in control, and she found comfort in doing things her way. She did not want Matilda to visit again, yet knew there was no hope of that. Her nose was already beginning to tickle, and she had a crawling sensation in her throat. Randall entered and shut the door softly beside him. He had changed out of his other attire and was now wearing a green velvet brocade embroidered vest under a black jacket. The chain of a pocket watch caught the light as he moved toward her, glimmering remarkably. Gorgeous, Maddie thought. She meant all of him. I'd like to go home, she announced as Randall approached her. You can do that, right? I mean, you did orchestrate my whole arrival here, and after the last day or so, I'm ready to get back to the way things were, crappy as it might have been. When he didn't answer immediately, she continued, This is an interesting place and from, you know, an aesthetic perspective, but I really miss gas station coffee and Twinkies. Randall looked grim, his brows so far down over his eyes, he almost looked as if he were scowling. She stopped talking. In time, he said, after a moment's pause. He rubbed his hands together as if he were cold, but it wasn't cold in the room at all. As he approached, she noted the rosy color on his cheeks and the distinctly outdoor smell he brought with him. I came as soon as I could, said Randall, clearing his throat. I, he faltered, shaking his head and tried again. I had no idea, Halver had, that Matilda would be so difficult. We thought it would work as a complete switch, or at least as a replacement. But I didn't know she could surface, that she could take you over. It had to be terrifying, to say the least. How did you know? Maddie asked, half ashamed. Halver always leaves his tea in the kitchen after after they... Randall looked a little embarrassed. I didn't think you would have gone through with something like that of your own volition. Randall gave her a pained and yet hopeful look. I'm glad you think I'm... you don't think I'm that much of a slut, Maddie said, but I still have to go along with the whole thing. She's very forceful when she wants to be, it seems. You weren't maligned in any way. I had to watch, Maddie blurted, and found she was on the verge of tears. I had to do things. I felt everything, but I couldn't control it. That was really messed up. Randall looked genuinely horrified, pressing his fingers into the bridge of his nose. It looked like he might even cry. I am so sorry, Madeline. I never wanted you to experience such a test, not ever. Matilda, for as much as she is like you, is not you. I hoped you'd have a more gentle initiation. There is a bright side, sort of, Maddie said, turning and wiping her eyes. Oh? asked Randall. I'm at least accepting that this can't be a dream. But whatever this is, whatever this other reality is, I'm definitely over it. I want to go home. Randall chewed at his bottom lip, waiting an uncomfortable moment before replying. Madeline, he said softly, I assure you that if I could send you back, you would go back, but the touchstone only works one way. Touchstone? Maddie asked. The mirror, said Randall. You see, the mirror was years of work on my part. It was very difficult to arrange for Dr. Keats to purchase it, considering the lineage of such a piece, and to pinpoint it in your world in the first place. So that mirror is the same here as in the future? Asked Maddie, trying to assemble what Randall had described. Not the future. This is not the past. Not your past, I should say, Randall said firmly. This is a very separate, unique world, connected in many ways to yours, but not yours. Of course, Maddie said, feeling very weary. 
She closed her eyes longer than would one would with just a blink and stared at the back of her eyelids. Are you all right? he asked. The stress, it's getting to you. No, it's just a little overwhelming to absorb at once, Maddie said, tossing her hands up in resignation. I have no idea what you're talking about or what kind of weird warped present this is, and I really just want to get home. But apparently that's too much to ask after I was brought here against my will. Randall tried again. The mirror is the touchstone, a gateway, a portal between worlds. So through this Boston, as I mentioned, as much as the present is your home, we are mostly in sync, but there are times where there are unpredictable hiccups. Sometimes travel is possible. Maddie considered pulling it a long curl, straightening it out, and then letting it bounce back. That can't be easy to account for. Some rare twains, like Alvin, can travel between worlds without such objects. We call them wanderers. But the touchstones are an alternate method, particularly useful for the uninitiated to travel between worlds. Worlds? Plural? Yes, there are eight worlds. Right, and eight Maddies running around. Maddie tried not to laugh. Looking at Randall's sincere, sober face helped a great deal in that respect. More or less, yes, though currently there are only three, we think. At any rate, if you can work with Matilda, you may be able to get home on your own, moving between the worlds as Randy and I are able to do. You could simply jump back to your world and free yourself of our sordid problems, never to consider Alvin again for the rest of your life. Okay, easy enough. So tell me how you switch with Randy. Randy and I are different. I have moved back and forth many times, and though it's often a significant challenge to work with him, as I cannot permeate his somewhat complicated disability, Randall used the word awkwardly as if he had searched for another term but could not locate a more accurate replacement, he has never left your world. Great, Maddie said, folding her arms across her chest. You brought me here, into this body that I can't control because you thought that I wanted answers about Alvin. Now you're telling me that the only way back is to work with my crazed, opium-addicted evil twin? That's not exactly fair. It's not a matter of simply returning you or telling you how to do it with Matilda. It's, it's more... Maddie's patience disintegrated. Her head throbbed with every heartbeat, and what she really wanted was more opium. Really? What's wrong with you? I just spent the last year of my life trying to forget Alvin, trying to mourn, to make sense of my own life. And just when I finally reconciled all that, you take me here and tell me Alvin's alive. That's a special kind of cruel. Whatever feeling of trust she had toward him was quickly dissipating and being replaced by searing hatred and all out ire. Randall spread his hands out as if it's some sort of peace offering and then shrugged. But I thought you would want to see Alvin. Well, I don't. You really don't want to know where he is? He asked. He raised his eyebrows, pleading one moment, then turning impish the next. Tell me you aren't the least bit curious. In spite of his infidelity, you loved him once. I did. Once, Maddie said. Meanwhile, I'm stuck here, wherever the hell this is. This is second world, Randall said. He held up two fingers. And this world is not so reprehensible or backward as you might deduce from our meeting Halver, Matilda, and myself. I haven't seen more than the inside of this room. It gets better out there, asked Maddie, admittedly intrigued. She gestured to the drawn drapes. I gathered it's winter. Yes, it's been snowing. It's lovely. If you'd permit me, I'd like to show you around the city a little. I'll take you to my office as well. Randall had a way about him. She had to admit that. It was beyond convincing. His smile was so familiar, so randy, that try as she might otherwise, her resistance waned. She desperately needed to trust someone. Maddie was trying to come up with a reason to refuse him, but all she could think about were the aesthetic possibilities. If this Boston truly was its own entity, yet related to her own, the possibilities were tantalizing. She couldn't resist the opportunity to explore an alternate world akin to her own and yet entirely set apart. While she knew she'd never managed to publish a paper on it without becoming the laughingstock of academia, it was an opportunity she couldn't pass up. Randall smiled. For an art historian, I can't stress how remarkable it will be for you to experience this Boston. It truly is a marvel, rivaling Paris and Londinium. He knew her too damned well. Londinium? 
She was about to say more when she was hit by a wave of pain in her head. She bent over, wincing against it. Ah, yes, the withdrawal, Randall said, shaking his hand. Or Matilda, it's hard to tell the difference, Maddie said. Randall winced, reaching into his waistcoat pocket and retrieving a small packet with marked handwritten script in blue ink. He placed it on the dresser. It's not a cure-all, but it will alleviate the worst of it for a few hours, perhaps. What's this? she asked. A combination of verbs, similar to what you'd call aspirin, I think, but with an extra kick. It'll take the edge off, and it's safe enough for short periods of time. Comforting. She picked up the packet and turned it around. She couldn't read the writing. It had blurred slightly as if exposed to too much moisture. Under the paper, she could feel soft capsules. Sweets to the sweet, she said with a sigh. I'll send Mrs. Fitz to help you into your clothing, and then we can go for a walk. Might as well, she said. Let's just hope Matilda doesn't come along for the ride. Randall sobered, pausing at the door. Yes, let us hope. The words were intended to be comforting, but Maddie felt a sense of dread as Randall shut the door. After Mrs. Fitz was done dressing her, and even with the admitted allayment of her headache by the medicine Randall gave her, Maddie wondered how on earth she would manage to walk for more than 15 feet without keeling over again on account of her outfit. The dress she wore was no doubt a most fetching cut, even she couldn't deny that, but the discomfort of the corset at her waist, cinching the living daylights out of her, was practically intolerable. The torturous corset was the centerpiece of the whole affair, made of hammered silver metal, its frame stitched with a backing of muslin dyed deepest crimson, so that the red shone through the gaps in the metal panels. As a result, her small breasts were pushed up and covered again with a white sheer material that went all the way to her neck, fastened with tiny pearl buttons. The blouse flared slightly at the shoulders, though nothing as extraordinary as she'd seen in some late Victorian examples, and then tapered to her wrists. Beneath the corset fell layers of red and gray fabric embroidered elegantly with interlocking leaf patterns. The hem was silver too, offsetting the design on the corset. All in all, a tremendous effort, mercilessly squeezing in her middle and bearing down on her body. Over the entire dress, Mrs. Fitz put a short cropped jacket embroidered with mid-fleur, that dizzying floral pattern of the unicorn tapestries. As over the top as it was, it was still perfect in its combination with the rest of the ensemble. The, she stepped into a pair of boots buttoned down the side with silver buttons, soft as kid and lined with mink. A simple, single plume adorned her little black hat with a short veil that fell just above her eyes. Really, all display and no utility there. The cameo or the flower brooch? Mrs. Fitz asked, holding out two pieces of jewelry. The cameo depicted a woman at three-quarters pose, with a laurel garland in her hair, the detail striking even in duotone. Maddie could swear the woman was looking at her and shook her head. The flower brooch, on the other hand, was cut red glass, fashioned in a manner as to make the petals look remarkably lifelike. The flower brooch, said Maddie without hesitating. As beautiful as the cameo was, something about it unsettled her. It reminded her a little too much of Matilda, lingering and looking. Mrs. Fitz nodded and then pinned to her lapel with her deft fingers. There we are now, she pronounced at last. A right lovely lady. Maddie had not ventured, to her knowledge at least, any further than the expansive bedroom in which she'd awoken. She vaguely recalled the shop that she'd seen upon first arriving, staring into that strange mirror, and assumed that the house would be situated in such a way that the boutique was adjacent to the house. Memories from Matilda, no doubt. Even when she was hiding, Matilda had a way of being present. On shaky feet and with her head throbbing again, Maddie followed Mrs. Fitz out of the large oak door and into the hallway. It was bathed in warm sunlight, provided by a series of themed stained glass sun windows that ran the length of the ceiling, depicting scenes from the Song of Roland, except Roland was a woman. Everything was carved of dark wood, or else wallpapered with extravagant designs that spoke of influence from Morris and the arts and crafts movement, yet with a persistent Victorian note. Intricate brass lighting fixtures lined the hallways, and even simple objects, like doorknobs and crown molding, took on a life of their own when rendered with artistic, naturalistic flair. Maddie was so taken aback by the art that she stopped walking just to stare. Madam? Mrs. Fitz asked behind her, clearing her throat. Yes? 
"Do you want to take the lift?" she asked, giving her a curious glance and pointing behind them. "Oh, yes," said Mattie, "of course." Mrs. Fitz gestured to her left with a wide sweep of her hands, and Mattie viewed the so called lift for the first time. To call it an elevator would insult the sheer artistry of it, so elegant it was. The first set of doors revealed a filigree of floral flourishes and intertwining vines, etched in such detail as to make the two dimensional metal look as if it were carved in relief. When these doors pulled away, the inner doors, polished so deftly they were as smooth as mirrors, parted to reveal the intricate inner sanctum, a combination of dark mahogany wood and mirrors, set with an oil painting and crystal sconces. In the middle was an immense chandelier, dripping crystal drops as real as rain. There was a crank to the side, the shaft bright burnished bronze and shaped like a unicorn's horn, but set with a round knob on the top. It was Baroque organic perfection with a Victorian accent, baffling but beautiful. Gaping still, trying to rein in her wonder, Maddie walked into the lift and folded her hands one over the other. Mrs. Fitz pressed a series of buttons inside, pulled an ivory-adorned knob in the middle, then pushed it down with a twist of her pudgy hand. There followed a low grinding sound from somewhere below them, then a steamy hiss. The doors closed, and they began their descent. Three bells chimed, and the lift came to a stop. Softer, Maddie reflected, than even some of the elevators she'd ridden in before in her other life, and opened into another hallway, much like the one she had seen with the Roland windows. While the design and decoration of the Roth home was by no means as elaborate as a place like Versailles, it still had a certain whimsical similarity, albeit with a more utility throughout. The Roths fancied mirrors and used them to generate a feeling of space within the home, which was already quite spacious and combined the cozy colors of green and red with dark mahogany and gold. Many walls were adorned with artwork, sculptures, paintings. Others held volumes and volumes of books, their straight spines in a rainbow of colors, adding their own beauty to the overall design. Randall was waiting in the foyer, dressed in yet another outfit, one that complemented Maddie's frock precisely. He wore a long maroon wool jacket, cut tight around his trim middle, set with a sash over the shoulder in silver. His russet brown hair was tied back, and he wore what could be only described as a low top hat, set with a silk band. He carried a brass cane, which he turned over in his hands nervously. A vision, as always, Randall said. He squeezed Maddie's arm lightly, and it comforted her. She could feel the warmth of his body so close to hers, reassuring and undeniably real. It felt like being with Randy, in spite of how different they were. She couldn't shake her comfort, which both annoyed her and enticed her. She wanted to know more of him, and she hated herself for even thinking that. Did she want to love him because he wasn't unusual, like Randy? You'll have a chance to see a little more of the house later, but for now, I want you to experience the aesthetic wonder that is our great city, Randy said, quietly so Mrs. Fitz could not hear. He leaned over to her ear. Boston is a center of fashion, and we are fashion's center. I can see that, Matilda said. So much for sweatpants. Randall chuckled. How are you feeling? He asked as they made their way down a few stairs and into a long hallway that led to a pair of towering wooden doors. Stained glass here depicted two coats of arms, but both so elaborate that Maddie could not tell what they represented. Light and a little noise from outside reverberated down the hallway. Headaches a bit better, but this corset's a piece of work, she said with a wince. Indeed, said Randall. I do not envy women for their adherence to fashion, but if you are to be Matilda for the time being, you should play the part. People would pass out in the streets should they see you in public without a corset. God forbid, Maddie replied. Here we are. Our carriage awaits, Randall said, as the doors were cast open. A blonde boy stood on the other side of the door, dressed in blue from head to toe, gesturing down a flight of marble stairs into a carriage guided not by horses, but by a marvelous golden wheel affixed to a track. The wheel glimmered in the cold morning light, and as stately and elegant and mysterious as it was, Maddie stared at it for only a moment, for the world around her opened up like a vast, incredible dream. Across the cobblestone street read Beacon Hill District, and they were, in fact, on an actual hill. From where Maddie stood, she could see all of Boston sprawled out before her, a Boston so different from the one she'd known in her other life that she felt her head swim with the view. 
The sky was smoggy as she remembered it, but dotted with hundreds of air balloons, many of which were so complex and colorful they looked like floating bouquets of flowers. There were no skyscrapers that could be seen immediately, but there were many tall buildings all the same, with spires, both of the church and the civic variety. And the city was alive. Carriages, all with similar golden guiding wheels, maneuvered through the streets while people bustled about, mostly too busy in their days to notice Maddie and Randall exiting the house. Music was coming from somewhere. Someone laughed. There were trees, shrubs, and plants everywhere, mostly evergreen. What snow had fallen recently had been moved out of the street or melted altogether, but some still hung on eaves. Ice glinted off every iron grate. Your fur, madam, said Mrs. Fitz behind her. Maddie felt the warm embrace of a soul around her shoulders. And your purse? She took it, and Randall continued to help her down the stairs and into the carriage as she compl complied in a most dazed manner. The carriage was painted bright green on the outside, with a series of scrolling numbers on a brass plate affixed to it. Inside, it was much warmer, the seats smooth velvet, and the glass-paned windows of double thickness. Maddie situated herself, sitting a little awkwardly with the bustle, and Randall smiled. You are unusually mute, he said. I honestly don't know what to say. Then keep your eyes open and enjoy yourself. Randall tapped his cane on a brass panel before them, and the carriage car hissed and began rolling forward. It was surprisingly smooth and built up speed in an impressive pace. Heat emanated from a vent in front of them, but in spite of it, Maddie shivered. How does this thing work? she asked Randall. I mean, considering no one is driving. Well, this functions by virtue of a rudimentary programming. Instead of motor, propulsion is achieved by a series of impressive magnets run in a vast network throughout the city. He pointed to a panel on the side of the carriage where the series of sliding knobs were arranged, much like a brass-plated soundboard in a music studio. It's altogether not that complicated and far safer than your self-propelled cars. Dangerous lots those are, especially that tin can you rattle around in. The memory of the Civic, the smell of the heat in the winter when she first turned it on, came rushing back to Maddie, and she felt a little dizzy with the recollection. Her own memories were starting to feel less and less trustworthy. Her car had been brown, right? Or was it blue? She decided to think of something else. I've been meaning to ask, she said, staring out the window as they passed a group of school children all dressed in yellow and black and little bumblebee, like little bumblebees. If my body, I mean... If this is Matilda's body, and she's here too, what's going on with my body? Could she skip over to my side and take my body for a ride? Well, Matilda has never had a desire for transcorporeal travel as far as I know. It's unlikely she'll go to your world. You know, that's almost comforting. As to your body, said Randall, you are likely still staring at the mirror in suspended animation. At least, Alvin used to say that I nodded off when I traveled, and he would often prop me up in the library with a book so no one would notice. But I always go somewhere safe. And Dr. Keats's house is safe? He has been given instructions, Randall said somewhat cryptically. Randy knows what to expect as well. As I said before, he understands. The thought of her body standing frozen in front of a mirror like Lot's wife made her shudder. And as a second-to-second -second comparison, I mean, time is exactly the same? Mostly. Here you go with the mostly again. As uncomfortable as the course of their conversation was, Maddie found herself utterly distracted by the landscape. In fact, Randall was talking at length about transcorporeal travel, but what she saw in the streets of Boston distracted her from his words entirely. This was a brand new chapter in her love of design, and she was trying to put her finger on the aesthetics she observed. Yes, there was certainly a Victorian influence with a splash of Edwardian. Yet everywhere she turned, she saw hints of the Pre-Raphaelites and of Morris, the building, the fashion, the wrought iron. But nothing was quite as she remembered it from her own world. It was as if someone had presented a visual representation of a memory of an aesthetic, rather than built one from scratch, a bit like drawing a picture of an elephant without ever seeing one before, only reading about it. Though for all that, it was no less elegant or beautiful. She felt Randall's eyes on her, but continued to look out the window. He had gone quiet. More of Boston came into view, and Maddie got a clearer look at one of the hot air balloons far above the skyline. They were tiered balloons, she now saw, with what had to be buildings below them, suspended unbelievably in air. 
Could that possibly be? Randall smiled, noting her expression. As I said, we do well for ourselves in the Beacon Hill District, he said, with a quirk of his lips. But there are those in town who take extravagance to a new level. Those are houses? Up there? All the way up there? she asked. It was like seeing the breakers suspended 500 feet into the sky. She couldn't quite make out the details of the homes, but there had to be close to 200 of them. Other flying contraptions, smaller ones, darted to and fro between the buildings in the air. Assuredly, he said softly, it's not the land that's important, but rather the grandeur and scope of the whole business. You can imagine the cost of refueling those. Some even produce their own gases inside. He shook his head disapprovingly. It's a beautiful sight, to be sure, but every now and again one of them erupts into flames. Quite a few million pounds have been spent researching what other methods for elevation, but none have been found yet. Would you like to see them? We have an invitation to call on Count Gaskin, one of the inhabitants, tomorrow. It is a gala event. Count Gaskin? A middling noble. The monarchy is very important here, as small as it is. Boston, though, you never believe it, is surrounded by wilderness to the west. These United States comprise mostly the eastern seaboard and little else, along with what you might call the megalopolis. At any rate, we never did away with the monarchy here. I suppose they give everyone a feeling of comfort, of order. It's been at least five years since the last scuffle with the wilds, but there's always a possibility. Wilds? Maddie squinted at Randall, like the Wild West? Not exactly. You see, we never quite managed to make our way part past the hardier tribes of the Appalachians. I'd love to get my hands on some of their art, Maddie said, almost breathless with the possibility. Native tribes out there flourishing for hundreds of years without disruption? Oh, I'm afraid that we'll have to wait some time, hostilities being as they are. And I didn't say it was without disruption. Maddie's head was hurting again, helped in no small part by squinting and craning her neck toward the floating mansions in the sky. How peculiar. Why would anyone, she thought, risk so much to make that kind of statement? Though, she had to admit, cities in her world were built almost as precariously, destined to be wiped away in the wake of a hurricane or an earthquake. Maybe Randall was right. People weren't so different after all, even worlds apart. She rubbed at her temple, staring now at the brown row of houses on either side of the road. They were mostly familiar, except less stark than she was used to. There were as much part of her Boston as this one, but here there was a more defined personality to each house. Different topiaries, various wrought iron gates, elaborate gardens, custom paint. Still, seeing the brown buildings was enough to be almost, almost a comfort. So what's caused the difference between our two worlds? Asked Maddie, looking at, sidelong at Randall. Was it one large event that sent this world into its direction and ours into another? The haberdasher looked surprised at the question and rubbed his chin. I have often wondered the same, having not been around quite long enough to know for certain. Not quite long enough? Randall shook his head, just a turn of phrase. But first and foremost, this country here was built not on the principles of God himself, but on Mary herself, with the belief that, as the mother of God, she literally was, and is, the mother of all. So you can imagine immediately how much of an impact that made, like ripples in a pool. That explains the Marian slant I noticed earlier with Halvor. Precisely, medicine, as you likely saw upon meeting Douglas, is controlled by her church, as are the banks. The rest, law and criminal justice and science, are in the hands of the SOF, the Society of Friends, a long branch of the Quakers. I can see how that would change the, source, the course of the world. I mean, we have Quakers, but most people don't know them outside of the whole oatmeal thing. Randall laughed, getting the joke. He seemed very much a part of this world, and yet he knew some of her old life. Maddie found her mood brightened. She wiggled a little deeper into her stole, marveling in the properties of fur, something she had never had the chance, the lack of conscience, or the money to wear before. But it goes far beyond practical religion, uh, Randall said, somewhat less enthusiastically. He cleared his throat and looked down at his hands. He was delaying. Beyond how? asked Maddie. I've got the monarchy thing down, the wilds, whatever that means. Seems like enough to make a difference. Randall mumbled something that sounded like argon. What? Dragons, he said, not meeting her eye. Like dragon dragons? Like rawr, dragons spitting fire? No, no, not quite like you think. Most of them don't walk around as dragons. That would be quite difficult to manage, I think. I'm losing you again. The word is somewhat loaded, said Randall. 
hence my hesitance to use it. But from the Greek, a dragon simply means that which sees. Certainly a few of them over time have preferred a scales and teeth approach, but that is far from normal. Normal, right, because there are normal dragons? Yes, there are dragons. Here our dragons are like gods. We have a much more intimate connection with them. They live among us, recognized in many instances. Your world is known for its remoteness, its resilience to such things, which is why it was so difficult to get you here. It was difficult to get me here because there aren't any dragons in my world. I didn't say there weren't any dragons in your world, said Randall. On the contrary, it's only that they so often go about unnoticed, recognized only as prophets or seers or saviors. Like Jesus? Wait, are you telling me Jesus was a dragon? Jesus was not a dragon, said Randall. Not Clearly this isn't the time for such a conversation. We're, we're almost at my office. He pointed out of the window to a Tudor-style townhome stretching down half a block. A variety of signs hung from posts denoting an assortment of archaic-sounding businesses, including an inn called, of course, the Red Dragon. They got out of the carriage at a little docking station designed for just such a and Maddie followed Randall into the building and up a narrow flight of stairs, two doors down from the inn and tavern to the third story. No lifts in this building, and it seemed almost medieval by contrast to the Roth's home. When they came to a green glass door, he pointed to the stenciled letters there. Mrs. R. A. Roth and J. G. Ioshika. No further elaboration. Maddie's second sense, which she attributed to Matilda's lingering memories, gave her no clues as to where she was or what she could feel. As she walked into the room for the first time since coming to Second World, she felt no connection to the place whatsoever. It was part laboratory and part library, half of the room being taken up by a wide assortment of Bunsen burners and beakers, all long, empty, and cleaned out, and the other with books stacked up to the ceiling. It smelled of lingering chemicals and a hint of mildew. Two desks sat on opposite sides of the room, one cleared completely and another in a state of utter chaos. This is where Alvin and I spend most of our time, Randall said. Wanting to skirt the subject of Alvin, Maddie asked, Who's J.G. Ioshika? She shivered into her stole. It was alarmingly cold in the office. And while there was a fireplace buried behind a chest of drawers, she figured there wasn't much of a chance that it was in working condition. Well, that's who I've brought here to, here to talk to. Before we talk about Alvin, Randall said, going over to the cluttered desk. He removed a ring of keys from his pocket, and after a few tries, no doubt due to the decidedly dim light, he got the drawer open. This Ioshika guy is not on your desk, I hope, Maddie said. She noticed a row of pickled specimens on the other side of the room and backed away. Or over there. Randall laughed. Dear me, no, but those are his. He's a bit of a biologist, but it's been some time since we shared the office, though I keep his things here as a matter of sentiment, I suppose. He's not here and you want me to talk to him? Maddie asked. Perhaps Randall was a little more addled than she had been led to believe. Randall pulled out a small silver compact from the desk and held it out to her. It looked like a woman's makeup compact, the sort of thing she'd seen at Victorian Albert Museum. It was finely made and glittered, even in the dark room. It works better in darker places, Randall said, flipping it open, or else I would turn the light on. Come over here. Take a look. Don't look at me so suspiciously. Maddie took a few steps closer, and Randall held out his arms. They were both looking at the compact. This close up, she was aware it was thrumming slightly, like a tiny, purring motor. As she turned to see it better, she noticed that where the mirror would be was a piece of iridescent cloth, and instead of powder, there was a smooth brass with a large red stone in the middle, looking much like the one in the cabochon ring Alvin had given her. Take it, Randall said. It's not going to electrocute me, is it? She ch he chuckled. No, it won't. Here, press your thumb on the top of the red stone, then watch and listen. The compact was warm in her hands, far warmer than it should have been from being held from such a short time, and it vibrated in concert with the purring noise. She looked sidelong at Randall, who looked as excited as a parent on Christmas morning, and then pressed her thumb into the stone. At first, nothing happened. Then she felt her thumb ache a moment, as if bruised.
Before she had time to question it, however, the cloth at the top began changing colors, bleeding into a variety of shades until a face appeared. Then the face began to move. It was like a miniature television rendered in fabric. And while she knew she ought to wonder more fully at the mechanism in her hand, Maddie found her attention elsewhere, for she was looking at Ian's face. You did it, said the man who looked like Ian on the other side of the compact. He was older than Ian and more fit. Maddie remembered the painting in her room. John, she murmured. Wait, this isn't Matilda, is it? John asked, squinting through the transmission. Maddie looked over at Randall, unsure what to say. He gestured for her to speak. No, no, this is Maddie. Madeline, she said. She was nervous. Well, mostly. Randall said something about transcorporeal travel. John laughed. I thought so. Excellent. Good on you, Randall. And welcome to Second World, Madeline. You can just call me Maddie, she said. Randall came up behind her, putting a hand on her shoulder. She drew a breath at the touch, but tried to keep her face still. It wasn't easy, but it worked, he said. And I wouldn't trust this with Matilda. You know how she is. Indeed, indeed. Well, Madeline, are you faring well with this scoundrel? John asked, quirking his lip just like Ian. Scoundrel, she asked. John chuckled again. Figuratively, he's a good person, Maddie. No need to worry. You're in good hands. I didn't have much of a choice in the matter, Maddie said. John raised the eyebrows, the picture becoming less precise for a moment before resolving again. None of us have the choice to be what we are. Sooner or later, I would have figured out a way to get you here through Ian, you know. Randall's approach was gentler and quicker. There was a threat there that made Maddie shiver. You know about Ian, she asked. And he knows about me. But don't worry, we're on good terms. He's been keeping an eye on you since Alvin left your world. And in a way, I've been keeping an eye on you too. Of course, and he... Of course, Alvin will be furious if he finds out that I've helped you, not to mention Mary, John pointed out, flicking his eyes to Randall. I know, Randall said, but you've got the best capabilities, even if you are out there in the wilds. It's not as wild as you think, Randall. I believe you'd quite enjoy it, John said with a knowing grin. Randall chuckled. I know. I'm afraid I'd never return. You act like that's a bad thing, John said. I'm not ready yet, Randall replied. He felt very quiet, and his hand slipped off Maddie's shoulder. But rather than continue in the line of conversation to respond to Maddie's inquiring eyes, he said, One more thing. Uh, you haven't happened to see Alvin in the last few days, have you? John frowned. Afraid not. He doesn't typically come to me unless he's truly desperate. Keep an eye out for him, will you? John nodded. I will. Take care. Randall took the combat pack from Maddie, snapped it shut, and stowed it in his waistcoat pocket. We have an appointment to keep with the Hildebrands, he said, not making eye contact. Wait, wait, what? She asked. We have an appointment? It's all a lot to swallow. Indeed, and I'm sorry, but I thought you'd be glad to see, glad to find out this creep's been spying on me, that, that he's apparently my cousin or something, according to Mrs. Fitz, when another world I slept with him? He's not really your cousin, said Randall, or at least no more than I'm. And what's this thing about losing Alvin? I thought you told me you knew who he was. Was that the whole reason you brought me here to see Alvin? Maddie, I... You just said you didn't really want to see him, so I didn't press the issue. And then he rather vanished. Fantastic, Maddie said. Let's just go. I want to get back home and go to sleep. Randall looked crestfallen, but Maddie stomped out of his office nonetheless and waited for him to catch up tapping her foot in the hallway. It was going to be a quiet ride to the Hill de Brants, whoever the hell they were.